So thank you to Sophia for stepping in uh, at the last moment. And uh, today Sophia will be speaking about scalable inference for complex environmental data. And uh, you will notice that the chair and the co-author list has a non-zero overlap. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, thanks for the organizers to ask me to speak. Um, so I'm using the word environmental here a little bit careless. Um, I could probably talk about application in atmospheric and geophysical settings as well. Uh, as, as I'm going to be talking about observations in space and time in general and uh, sort of recent innovations and in making inferences in such settings. Uh, so getting observations from our oceans is non-trivial. Uh, as a mathematician, I probably would like to assume I've got an even grid of observations that go all across the <coughs> ocean, but unfortunately that's not economically feasible. Uh, and the way we acquire information about our oceans, well, what, why do we care about our oceans? We care about our oceans because anything that happens on longer than 10 years in terms of climate is integrally interconnected with our oceans, our ocean circulation. And secondly, a lot of real physical problems arise uh, that ocean circulation affect, such as, for instance, if a plane goes down and you want to figure out where it's ended up, uh, circulation is going to tell you what currents are most prevalent. So if we can't have regular gridded observations the way uh, the mathematician in me would want to, what do we have in terms of making observations? Well, uh, we have satellite observations, um, we've got ships making direct observations in very limited areas. We might have arrays, which are regular, but they will not cover a lot of area indeed. And we have floating or drifting instruments in general. And that's how we gather most of the information that we know about our ocean. Uh, so that's one area where we're trying to make sense of phenomena that arise in time and space. Uh, another area where we're trying to make sense of observations, I also study uh, our planet Earth, uh, and I've been looking at aspects of topography and gravity. Um, there are measurements of time varying gravity. What you see on the left hand side there is grace. Why do we care about time varying gravity? Well, if you're looking at effects that occur because ice is melting, you're going to be able to detect that using grace. Uh, and what you have on the right hand side, something a Swedish person should never be asked to pronounce, it's a gravi gravimeter, and I can't say that word. Uh, which makes it very embarrassing that I actually deal with data from them. Um, <laughs> so uh, these observations also take the forms of recording in time and space in the instance of grace. Uh, usually when we have just gravitational measurements, ha, I avoided it there, uh, we just get spatial observations in general. And also we want to make sense of other planets around us. Uh, that's the topography of Venus. And understanding more about planet formation and sort of basic scientific aspects <coughs> of the universe comes down to taking measurements and trying to make sense of the observations that we gather. Um, so having taken all these sorts of observations, you might ask yourself, well, how do we make sense of them all? How can we understand processes where we've taken sampled observations? So here you have gravity measurements from Grace again. Well, as a mathematician, what you ask yourself is, can we come up with mechanisms that might have generated the data that <coughs> we see? Is there actually structure that is part of that mechanism that we can estimate or make sense of? And do we have the tools to understand what's going on? And given the title of the talk, one of the challenges is exactly one of scalability because uh, the volume of observations coupled with the complexity of the models. I mean, we had before someone said it's big data only when we can't use today's tools to make sense of it. Well, problems arise not just because the volumes of data are big in themselves, but that the models that you have are complex enough that you run into problems when you try to use vanilla methods to run uh, with the data you have. Um, so, what are the basic problems that still dog making sense of spatial and temporal observations? Well, we have observations in time. On the right hand side, I just show an example uh, that I've been working on for a long time, which is the global drifter problem, uh, <coughs> where you have uh, basically floating measurement devices all through the oceans and you're trying to make sense of ocean circulations. 
There you get observations, and observations are gathered by satellite, and whenever they pass by one of the buoys, you get a, a <coughs> sort of a location observation. And there's a problem there because you're not getting regular observations in time. What you see here is just an example of the density of uh, time steps that you get normally across different latitudes. And as you can see, there, is a strong, uh, there are some strong periodicities of how you long you might expect to wait before you get a new observation. But you're getting many, many different times of time steps. So in general, it's a big problem trying to make sense of, of temporal observations that are not regular. Uh, these types of observations are also irregularly collected in space. So again, looking at the Global Drifter program, you see the density of observations in space. And you can see it's certainly not evenly spread across different latitudes and longitudes. And once you start to think about this process in space-time, you have the issues that you need to deal with irregular in time and in space <coughs> at the same time. Sometimes you can adjust uh, the actual sampling, and you can choose a sampling that will make your observations be convenient, but often it's set and fixed, and you're kind of forced to take it. It's just given to you. Uh, another problem that arises often you have many processes that you're observing, so you're not just observing one kind <coughs> of observation, and often they're observing uh, at different spatial and temporal resolution, which creates further difficulties of fusing <coughs> these data sets together. And the final challenge when you have all of this is that often you want to combine them with models, so you have complicated data <coughs> and complicated models. And just to give you, um, it's just an excuse to show you a video, I will confess, um, but I will just give you, uh, show you, of, for instance, this Global Drifter program. Um, let's just see. So you get a sense of the observation. So it's a study that's been going quite some time since the 1980s, and uh, you will now see the issue of data density <coughs> as we go across time. So what you can see here are the drifter trajectories. You can see time flashing by. At least we were all born back then. Uh, and you can see that the number of measurement devices are increasing as we go forward in time. The spread in space is certainly very irregular. It's spread in time too. Um, you can see the US were very <coughs> quick to launch uh, measurement devices. But also uh, the data values themselves, you can kind of make out different currents by the speed <coughs> of the <coughs> measurement devices. So this is sort of kind of a typical problem, just because the sampling is nowhere near what most of us will have learned in textbooks. It's not like uh, you have a regular space-time grid, you get the observations regularly in time and space, uh, you can just form a likelihood and then you can make observations. It's more like uh, we have these satellites. In 2005, we plonked a few more up, so your resolution changed. Uh, just deal with it, and what can you tell us about circulation? And it's also nice just to look at pretty pictures, <coughs> but we'll go back to the talk. <coughs> um, so, what do we need to deal with when we're trying to understand observations like that? So on the right-hand side, you have superimposed all the trajectories with different colors. It looks like a huge set of uh, spaghettis that were colored and just left to drift off. And on, on the bottom here, you see some of the inhomogeneities that are present in the data. Because of the way the drifters are moving around, this is one of the issues that causes the inhomogeneity because the speed of the currents is not homogeneous across the oceans, but you can make out things like the Gulf Current, the Aguilera Current, and several other currents on top. So you need to be able to deal with this inhomogeneity, and if you're analyzing all of those trajectories, you might say, oh, there are probably just 20,000 of them, compared to what other people were saying before. This should be a trivial thing to do, you know, on the Sunday afternoon when the kids are playing in the garden kind of thing. Uh, but the issues are, because of the inhomogeneity in time, you can't just set it running without carefully thinking about the analysis before. Uh, computational cost <coughs> quickly becomes an issue uh, because you're trying to fit models to all of the drifters. Uh, we haven't got to the point where we're 
linking them together and fitting all of them at one time, but we're starting off with modeling and fitting each director at a time. And there are issues of strong inhomogeneity, so whatever models we suggest or use, they don't actually fit all of the aspect of the observations, but you have to build in the fact that there is a misfit. So what's been going on in <laughs> statistics, um, well, given the chair is here, I had to cite him first, uh, but people have been developing new methods of making inferences <coughs> for longer time series uh, where we now approximate the likelihood. So all of the cited authors here, some of them are time, some of them are space time, have been developing new ways of trying to approximate likelihood, approximate the way we do the actual uh, estimation of the parameters of the models because otherwise you can't efficiently run it on all of the different trajectories that you need to do to make sense. Um, so what would it mean to make sense? Well, just to give you a notion of the complexity that you encounter, uh, we've here picked out some of the very annoying and complicated drifters. Uh, these are near the equator. Uh, that means that they're actually moving quite fast. And you can see against latitude, um, one of them, as just as it moves across latitude, well, as it moves, unfortunately, it means the model changes. And how can you see that the model is changing quite quickly? Well, if you look at one of the trajectories, just look at the velocity across time, no way could you persuade yourself that bits over here were actually generated by the same mechanism that generated the start of the trajectory. Um, so this is a big problem because traditional analysis would say, chunk it up, find bits of it that kind of look stable, do the analysis in bits, and glue it all together again. Unfortunately, here that's a big problem because you have these changes that are happening too rapidly. Um, if you tried to do that, the estimated variance of the estimated parameters would just get, well, the actual variance would get way too large. Uh, so some of the things uh, we've been doing in my group is trying to figure out how can we still analyze something that formally and traditionally you shouldn't be able to analyze. And just to show you again what's causing uh, these rapid inhomogeneities, well, it's actually just the, the speed of the movement, right? So, so you have inhomogeneities that come from the spatial location. And of course, the faster you move, if you're near the equator, you see <coughs> there are bits where the speed is quite near very red. And that means you're moving more rapidly. And that means you have issues making the analysis work. So, what can you do in this sort of scenario? Well, this is where somehow our mathematical understanding of the problem needs to be combined with what's efficient to do as estimation. Uh, so what my group has been doing uh, with me is figuring out mathematically what's going on when things change this rapidly. Uh, and I won't, um, <coughs> given one of the earlier speakers threw a lot of maths on, I won't dwell on this. But one of the components in the model uh, can be modeled quite precisely as a stochastic process xt times the thing that is making it inhomogeneous. And if we can assume enough things about it, then if we use regular estimation methods over a long window, even if things are changing very rapidly, we can estimate it as if we didn't have the inhomogeneity or change. And I feel compelled, just because there were theorems earlier, uh, you can ignore most of it, but what we've shown is with those assumptions, if you make the appropriate adjustments, if you estimate the parameters uh, taking account of the time variation, you actually get the rate of convergence you would as if those rapid changes hadn't been happening. Um, so, and <coughs> one of the advantages of this method is it's also an n log n method, so it's implementable very quickly. Um, what else do you need to capture in this oceanographic data? Well, first you sort of have to develop a cartoon understanding of what you might see in the data. And it's traditional to do a transformation of the data into its scales or its frequencies. <coughs> and the archetypical understanding is of a process with multiple peaks and bumps in it, where you're trying to understand each peak and bump. If you look at real data and you go across latitudes again, spatially varying where you're at, you will find that these peaks and bumps are modified or altered depending on where you are. So basically the estimation method needs to take account that as you move, you get inhomogeneity 
because you're moving to a different portion of space, but you still need to rapidly be able to make those inferences. So if you fit this model, uh, well, we now uh, can do it across all of the 20,000 uh, time courses. And so these are not like short time courses. Some of them correspond to several years' worth of data for one of the measurement devices. So it really is taking account of each length of data plus all of them together. Uh, well, if we fit these models, uh, we can learn something globally because once you've done this estimation for all of the drifters, you can get a map spatially of what's going on. Uh, so one of the quantities of interest is exactly how rough is the ocean, uh, which comes out from the slope of one of those peaks that we saw. And what you <coughs> see here is a global map from all the 20,000 trajectories, which unsurprisingly maps out, for instance, the Again, the Gulf current as being particularly rough uh, compared to the rest. Uh, you can also estimate things like you saw other peaks at other frequencies. You can estimate how spread they are um, and figure out, again, spatially what's the interpretation of that. And you can try to say, depending on your location, as you move around to different pieces of the ocean, how quickly might something diffuse from its position if it was just released and if these models were accurately describing all of the variations that you see. Um, well, that's not the whole uh, picture, of course. Uh, so all of these things that I've been talking about are thinking about the Global Drifter Program, which has moving measurement devices in the ocean. That's very much a Lagrangian point of view of a, of a fluid. Uh, we also have measurement observations that are Eulerian. Uh, where we look at the fluid from fixed locations and try to make sense of them. So, in a sense, the Global Drifter program is just one component of trying to understand the whole system of the ocean. You will have things like wind, and you will also have Eulerian observations that you do want to make sense of at the same time. So, you will have arrays that are set up, and often what you want to figure out when you have observations such as those is the relationship between uh, fluid observations that are made at different array points and figure out things like group delay and differences in timing between observations. And that's some other work I've done uh, with Shen Elipo. And finally, uh, the third component when you're trying to understand ocean data is very much that of plankton. So I've also studied the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation's <coughs> Global Plankton Recorder, where you're trying to figure out what changes are happening in the plankton densities for different species. And this is just showing, uh, again, this is quite complicated because the measurements people take of plankton, it's from commercial vessels which are asked to carry uh, the continuous plankton recorder with them and take recordings. And what you see on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side is the spatial extent of some of the plankton assemblages that we've made. And as you can see, unsurprisingly, there are quite considerable spatial changes before and after 1985 in terms of spread, and most species are moving uh, north quite a lot. No, I'm not going to comment on global warming. Uh, so having talked about temporal data, what about spatial observations? Well, I complained in time that things were difficult because the models were hard, and it took uh, a lot of time to do all of the computations. Spatial Spatial data is even more challenging. A lot of it comes due to there is more flexibility in how you do the spatial sampling, and there are more issues with having more of a boundary. If you think about a time course, boundaries just affect the two endpoints. If you're trying to do good analysis for spatial problems, the boundary is a lot more sig significant. Uh, the computational burden of ma exact methods, such as exact maximum likelihood, very, very rapidly uh, become completely unfeasible, and there's often quite a lot of spatial inhomogeneity. And in a lot of geophysical problems that I work on, you don't just want to assume that you can increase the domain, because you want to know the characteristics of this particular region. You don't just want to gather more data to get better statistical performance. Uh, so it very quickly becomes more of a trade-off between bias and accuracy. And there have <laughs> been a lot of recent innovations uh, just this year and slightly earlier, of trying to come up with new approximations to the likelihood function, which is, I think, much of current developments in spatial analysis as a, as a whole. 
Um, and I think it's, it's an area which we'll see a lot of further development. Uh, and finally, uh, with the last three minutes that I have, uh, I think another big problem is that most mathematical models concerning real phenomena in space assume isotropy. I think it's because back in the 1980s that meant that people could still do simple plots in terms of radi the radial distance. But unfortunately, most phenomena in real life, they move somewhere in the spectrum between being quite anisotropic to wholly unidirectional. And this is sort of important, for instance, if you're studying earthquakes, <laughs> um, anisotropy is an important characteristic to put into your earthquake model. And I've been uh, working a lot with collaborators in geosciences in trying to come up with better ways of modeling anisotropy and finding ways to do estimation. Of course, once you have anisotropy, an issue is that you get even less data because the, the direction which you have less or more spatial variation, you're not going to be gathering an equal amount of information depending on the direction that you're looking in. So uh, given I'm just about to finish for time, instead of telling you about some of the anisotropic tests I've been developing, I'm going to go to the end. Um, <coughs> I mean, you might have th thought that analysis of temporal phenomena is kind of an established field which people have been working on since uh, Schuster in, 19, in 1898, who first developed Fourier analysis for statistical processes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many problems are still outstanding, especially if your sampling is not regular. Uh, scalability is a big issue. So the drifter analysis, before we introduced the new technology, would take weeks to run on the whole data set. And now it's a lot, lot faster than that. I think Jonathan does it in a day. Isn't that right, Adam? And space is even a, a richer medium to be working on because you have a wealth of possible forms of variation that can happen. And I think that's why it's really disappointing uh, that a lot of classical methods for spatial statistics have been focused on isotropic processes because most things we see in real life are highly anisotropic. And I think we're just right now figuring out how to deal and analyze processes like that. Thank you. Uh, we also have some time for general questions and discussion. So, Maybe yeah. <coughs> so we, there's a parallel workshop, and people have talked about different, uh, working with applied maths, different uh, functional classes like wavelets and, and different sublog classes of functions you might fit. I mean, it, with, with this time frequency stuff, it, it does feel a bit like wavelets of some version, and, and this excuse the pun, of course, with ways. I mean, is, is, are you using your, some favorite class that you, that you do this? Um, so de facto, we're doing local Fourier analysis um, because we're fitting uh, spectral models over a range, but we're also doing more bespoke things for the regions where the temporal variation is very rapid because we can model the type of change across time and we can almost deconvolve the change out by putting it directly into the model. Uh, I think the general question of whether to use uh, sort of time frequency methods such as local Fourier, chirplets versus wavelets, it depends on the dynamic range you expect to see in frequency. If you have a lot of peaks that are time varying in frequency versus if you're having smooth functions with discontinuities, which wavelets are very good for, so, but then again, wavelets are good for approximating functions in general. They sort of have a lot of proven minimax properties. So it really depends on what you're studying. But if you have music or oceanography, I'd do local frequency. I wouldn't do wavelet. In the, in the communication, the sync wavelet, um, sine x, one x wavelet, I mean, <coughs> that, that share some of the properties of Fourier. And, and you use, is that the sort of thing? Uh, so the problem with the sync wavelet is it, it would have quite slow time decay. So it's very well localized in frequency, uh, but you pay for it in time. Uh, well, we do actually window, but then when we can model the inhomogeneity, we're kind of getting both of the best of both worlds because we can model the inhomogeneity directly and so don't need to approximate it. 
Any other questions? <coughs> I don't know if there were some uh, questions again for, for Andrew as well on the first talk, or um, <coughs> general comment. Open <coughs> general comment. Yes. For discussion. Yeah. Um, actually, the definition of big data itself, uh, because people are tending to give always new definitions for. <coughs> and I heard uh, today a couple of them today and uh, every time there is a new definition we, we try to characterize data as big is, is, a, is a very I don't know is, is not an objective qualification of data big, what is big, we don't know but I mean we just trying to say that it is hard or getting hard to deal with data Sometimes it's too easy to uh, deal with trillions of data just because uh, instances of data are not linked the one to the others. While it is very hard, I mean, sometimes to deal with some gigs of data just because the links between instances uh, are too many. I mean, I'm working you know, I, I, Nick presented uh, some data about Uniprot uh, today, and we are dealing with this every day, actually. So maybe some new qualification of data should appear by now, maybe challenging data that would gather together the bigness itself, <laughs> the uh, complexity of the data, <laughs> like this kind of data. <coughs> Whenever the data is complex, whenever we have too much, that's a challenge. If we have too much of data, that is not a challenge by itself. Yeah, this is my point. Okay. Any response to that comment? Anyone else? Yeah? Okay, so I think that's a, that's a good note for us to take a bit of an earlier coffee break, and then we can continue those discussions then. And the next session, <coughs> Uh, starts at 3.30. I'll just ask us to thank both of our speakers once again. For